New York has a colorful and long history with baseball, stretching back all the way to the 1800s, when we began our story in 1913. Back then, New York City had three major league teams, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants in the National League, and the New York Yankees in the American League. 1913 was the year the Yankees took their new name. The Dodgers opened Ebbets Field, and the Giants won their third pennant in a row in the new polo grounds. Back then and throughout the 1920s and 30s, the Giants were the dominant National League team, winning many pennants, but losing in most of their World Series outings. The Dodgers were loved by their Brooklyn fans, mostly for their fun-to-watch players like Babe Herman and the Daffiness Boys. The Yankees were just okay in the 1910s, but in 1920s they made a famous deal to acquire Babe Ruth from the Boston Red Sox along with many other talented players. These players started the Yankee dynasty of the 20th century. Coincidentally, it also ended a history of wins for the Boston Red Sox and began what would later become the curse of the Bambino. The Red Sox would now win another World Series for almost 100 years. The World Series in 1921, 1922, and 1923 was a Giants-Yankees matchup three years in a row. With the Giants winning the first two and the Yankees finally winning in 1923, the year they moved to the Yankee Stadium. They added more legends to the roster like Lou Gehrig and won another pennant in 1926 and two more World Series in 1927 and 1928. After World War II, the Dodgers added Jackie Robinson to the team. Jackie Robinson was the first African American to play in the Major Leagues. With the addition of Robinson and several other great players like Gil Hodges, the Dodgers became a dominant force in baseball. The late 1940s to the 50s became known as the golden age of baseball in New York City. The Dodgers and Giants always had a rivalry going, but the Dodgers manager did the unthinkable. He moved to the Giants. This was unforgivable, and year after year for nearly a decade, the two teams would fight each other to win the National League pennant. More often than not, the winner would then face the Yankees in the World Series. And then usually, the Yankees would win. The three teams from New York dominated baseball, and the Yankees won an unbelievable number of world championships year after year. But Emmett's Field and the Polo Grounds were aging. The teams needed new stadiums they could not get what they needed in New York. So in 1957, the Giants moved to San Francisco, and in 1958, the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles. The Yankees, of course, stayed in the Bronx and slowly declined their winning streak as the 1960s began. And a new area of New York baseball was about to begin. Now, the New York Mets. Meet the Mets. Meet the Mets. The Mets started in 1962. They played their first two seasons in the Giants' old stadium the Polo Grounds, and wow were they horrible. And here we are folks at the famous Polo Grounds. It's been a one-sided knockdown dragon out ball game right from the very first oh, inning. With the visiting team, the Birdie Gas House Gorillas, giving the home team, the Teetotalers, a shellacking they'll never forget. Baseball fan, oh, there goes a screaming liner into left field. Home team hasn't a chance, but they're in there punchy, nevertheless. Their first season's record of 40 wins and 120 losses is the third worst in modern baseball history and the worst ever in New York. In 1964, the Mets moved to Shea Stadium and began acquiring better talent, including a new pitcher named Tom Seaver. The team improved throughout the 1960s, and in 1969, just seven years after their horrible first season, the Mets won their first pennant and the their first World Series. They became known as the Miracle Mets, and the team won the hearts and minds of fans throughout the state. One player on that team was a young shortstop named Buddy Harrelson, who I'll tell you more about in a bit. Unlike the other New York teams, the Mets have never had a streak of pennant or World Series wins. 
They did win the pennant again in 1973, but it wouldn't be until 1986 that the Mets would become world champs once again. It was also in 1973 that the Yankees got a new owner, George Steinbrenner. With Steinbrenner came a new wave of players and a new era of winning. The Yankees added new legends to the team like home run slugger Reggie Jackson. They won the pennant in 1976 and won the World Series in both 1978 and 1979, ironically both times against the Dodgers. It looked like the Yankees might be on the verge of yet another decades-long streak, but it came to an end when they lost the World Series in 1981 against the Dodgers. The Yankees wouldn't see a postseason game until 1996, but luckily, New York baseball fans didn't have to wait that long for a World Series excitement. The Mets began improving in the early 1980s when they added new players such as Dwight Gooden. By 1986, they were an incredible team with 108 wins. The 1986 pennant and World Series were incredible for Mets fans. The Mets didn't win year after year like the Yankees had in their past, and the postseason games were nail biters. Several times, it looked like the end for the young baseball team. They played the Houston Astros for the National League Championships and really had to fight for it. The final game went on for 16 innings. But the real drama was in the World Series against the Boston Red Sox. 66 years after the curse of the Van Bino began with one New York team, it looked certain that the curse would be lifted with another one. The unfortunate Mets. By game six, the Mets were behind three games to two, and at two different points, the Red Sox were one strike away from the championship victory. Mets fans watched in waves of heartbreak and excitement as moment by moment, it seemed the Red Sox were certain to win, but then something would happen to keep the Mets alive. This was especially the case when Mookie Wilson hit an easy ground ball to the Red Sox first baseman. For a moment, everyone knew the game was over and the Mets lost because of this easy out. But the ball went through the first baseman's legs and the base runner on third scored to win the game. A few nights later, the Mets won again in Game 7 and won their second World Series, the only two so far in their team history. The Yankees sure do win a lot and they had yet another winning streak beginning in the 1990s, winning the World Series in 1996, 1998, 1999, and 2000 when they beat the Mets. The 2000 Subway Series was a big event for New York, the first time two New York teams faced each other in the World Series since the Yankees beat the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1956. Since then, the Yankees have been in two more World Series, winning only one, and the Mets were in last year's World Series but lost to the Royals. But despite all that, my family has almost always been Mets fans. My grandpa, who knows more about New York baseball than anyone I know, was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan as a kid. Here he is when he was about my age, meaning Jackie Robinson after a game at Ebbets Field. They asked him for an autograph, but Jackie pulled them over the wall and onto the field to pose for this photo. I also have some pieces of New York baseball history in my own home. My other grandpa got me this chair from the original Yankee Stadium. It commemorates when Derek Jr. retired and has some dirt from the field. If you look closely, it looks like there's a mustard stain on the chair from someone's hot dog. And here's a game ball I got from Buddy Harrelson, the shortstop from the 1969 Mets. I got this last year at a Ducks game. Buddy is the team manager and I was sitting with my dad and my grandpa just outside the Ducks dugout. 
He stuck his head out and saw us watching the game. Then he gave me this ball that he signed personally. Nobody knows what the future holds for baseball in New York, but one thing is for sure, it's going to be epic.